Well, good morning from Minnesota, USA, and uh, good afternoon from uh, South Africa. Um, I'm here with uh, Crosby, who has uh, quite the extensive history on the World Network's uh, wiki uh, page, which is just heartwarming to see all the work that you've been doing. And uh, I've asked uh, Crosby to just give us kind of a summary of what he's been doing with the solar caravan and this uh, cooker that just showed up on the on the web with the Fresnel lens and uh, hybrid with wood and so forth. Uh, but I always start off with the question, how did you learn about solar energy any way, shape, or form? And how did that uh, transpire into solar cooking? Hey, Luther, thanks for having me on the show. I really appreciate the work you're doing. And, uh, you know, it's an amazing that you're putting such a good bibliography together of everyone doing it we're quite a scattered family um so firstly thank you for your work it's uh Thanks. still a very unknown corner of the world this uh, solar cooking. yes <laughs> um yeah and to answer your question well you know uh the bug uh as deepak and some of the other people um uh, our professor in portugal they always say the virus got me in around 2001 um, and I saw these solar cookers up in Zambia and I had just come back from working corporate in London and I was kind of at a loose end as to what to do with my life. And I was like, man, this stuff is just amazing. I mean, the first I, my encounter was with a parabolic dish and it was with someone who is still a friend. His name is Matthias Weber. He's from Germany, and he had actually hitched all the way from Cologne through Africa, from Cologne, to find out why people weren't using solar cookers. Um, he and I later bumped into each other a few times in South Africa at, at rainbow gatherings, actually, at, of all things. Um, and he had a solar oven, and he was making peanut butter. I mean, he was making bread, and I had peanut butter and honey in my bag, and it was a match made in heaven. Um so it took a few months for the bugs to catch hold. And at that point, there was um, there was a GIZ-funded project, probably the world's best-funded project, um, that was based here in South Africa. So Matthias had already gotten some contact with the director. And it was just an incredible situation because they had... It was GIZ funded initially, then the UNDP took a third, and then a South African organization called the Central Energy Fund, which was quite newly set up. So it was a third South African, a third GIZ, and a third UNDP funded. They had a four by four vehicle with a rooftop tent, a big trailer, and a, com and a complete kitchen in the trailer with a whole bunch of parabolics from Germany. And they were sat there doing nothing. They were about four or five years into the project. I mean, really, just nothing. And the thing is that they were there for, they were researching if anyone in South Africa would be interested in solar cooking. So if you could show that you were using the vehicle for the purposes that the project was set up for, we could access the UN vehicle. And that's what we did. <laughs> um, it's so for around two years, we drove around in this vehicle. We went to every festival, every show. We went and cooked for the Botswana government. We helped the government in Swaziland, what's now called Eswatini, set up an entire solar cooker demo. Um, we were very active. And I, knew, I view that at that point we were called Rapid Dawn and I met the inventor of the SK cooker um, Zyford and Koch and and he really liked what we were doing so he gave us like 10 of the uh, the, the, the the SF10 or sun, I, it's the, the smaller parabolic unit the 1 meter and the 1.4 meter just to go and do demos so I went from seeing them and just being like, this is quite amazing. It was actually at an eclipse festival in Zambia. 
a full solar eclipse festival, then coming to some festivals in South Africa, um, rainbow gatherings, which are actually from the States. It's kind of like uh, people gather together for one month uh, from full moon to full moon and you all share food and you sit around the fire and you sing. It's, it's very, it's very hippie. It's very, it's magical, but it's extremely hippie. I had a lot of time on my hands and I was just trying to figure out what to do recovering from London. And um, yeah, Matthias is still in Cape Town. He stuck around. So him and I um, went into business together and um, we just drove Southern Africa flat in that car, promoting the solar cookers that no one else seemed to want to do anything with. And that was my intro. Wow. And is that kind of the germ for the idea of the, the caravan or was that the actual beginning of the caravan? I guess I haven't thought of that, but I think you're right. I think that is the germ, um, the spreading of the germ for the virus. So how do we spread the virus yeah. <laughs> of solar cooking? Um, I, um, yeah, like it became apparent that nobody had the word solar cooking in their vocabulary. Like it just wasn't and wasn't something that anyone had had heard of. I'd never heard of it. So I view those first two years as planting a lot of seed um, for for the solar cookers to actually take shape and form in the lexicon of the country. And they've certainly done that. So yeah, I guess it is the seed of the solar caravan. How do you how do you normalize something that's not even a technology that people have ever heard of? That's not a word they have in their vocabulary. Um, so from that perspective, it was really great to have um, all this access to equipment. We had we had a, a resource center where we could phone anyone in the world. Like I was basically working on a corporate level, but in an NGO basis. There were some dark sides, as we later found out, to the GIZ project and some of the NGO activity in Africa. But yes, I think it definitely is the kernel for the solar caravan. Yeah. Makes wow, sense. You've got, to, you've got to spread the message. Exactly. And uh, I think I might have mentioned my note. It's just uh, so much appeals to me. Uh, and that's why I hit the road in 2020, partly the due to the the uh, pandemic and getting stir crazy and having to get out of town. <laughs> just being able to collect stories such as yours. It was it was just such a, a wonderful trip. Uh, and to affirm one thing that you mentioned, it's not in the vocabulary. Not many people know about it. Uh, my message to the Consul Foods Conference uh, last July was from the hundred people I'd interviewed to date at that point, uh, people would have friends that did permaculture or they were schoolies, you know, and permies. And they, they they didn't know about solar cookers. They they remember the hot dog cooker from Boy Scouts or something, and it was just this yeah, exactly cute thing. But and so uh, I I pointed out. I said, man, if you know people in the permaculture movement, uh, let's start uh, doing some benevolent uh, insinuation of ourselves into those groups just to get the word out. Anyway, so that's uh, exactly to your point. There, uh, we need to do that kind of outreach. That's really cool. Um, it's really now that your story is inspiring, and so many people hit the road after 2019, going, you know, we need to live now. Let's do what yes. we need to do now, man. Exactly, exactly. Well, the the next thing up, I see uh, on the um, uh, in the wiki talking about the uh, Soul Four cooker, and I see the reference to light fire. So that was as far back as what 2015, I think where they were already in operation because that's kind of their thing now light fire there uh you can buy the plans uh on their uh it's kind of a crowdfunding thing and you and you are basically buying the plans to license them to turn into whatever you want to do a bakery and so forth um was that were, were those the original people light fire that uh set that up do you remember oh um yeah geez you know luther i feel like i've been living on under a rock but the truth is i've been living on top of a mountain for the last eight years um i'm a permaculturalist as well that was the one thing i studied when i came back from that that weird experience being corporate in london i did a two-week permaculture course and i actually did a tour around the whole country visiting schools and that was in fact a big inspiration for the solar cookers because I saw all these big feeding schemes and I was like, man, imagine we could do this without, uh, you know, natural gas or electricity. Um, but to go back, so, so yeah, and, and it, I, I'm part of quite a, because of that, like we're, I'm 
Sunfire is quite embedded in a team of very specialized sustainability experts. Like we can call on good architects, we can call on good seed savers, good permaculturalists. And it always seems like, you know, when you go into a community, what happens is they go, well, we like the cooking, but we've got this other problem over here with um, food, or we've got this other problem over here with the school, or uh, we've got another problem over there with, you know, water or sanitation. So in the last 20 years, we've built a team which we'll get into with the solar caravan that can actually go into a place and do a bit of a needs analysis and like an eco SWAT team that we we're hoping we can connect with the global community to really make a difference now because it feels like all of our work over the last 20, 30 years and the people that have come before us is really coming to fruition and flowering. Um, to go back to your question, I actually thought you were talking about the so I, I haven't really been following very much for the last eight years. I've been building an off-grid little village. Um, I moved from Johannesburg eight years ago. Figured, you know, you've got to get yourself off the bus before you talk about anyone else getting off the bus. And uh, nine months of no electricity and water was fun. Very bad for business. <laughs> Had a baby. Um and uh, yeah, right now I've got three teepees up, uh, a sandbag house, an 11 meter geodome, and a six meter or seven meter geodome, and a full scale permaculture garden. So sure. we work with a guy who's got his PhD in off grid electrification in Germany. He walked in one day with a spa with a screwdriver and said, "Do you mind if I?" I just said yes. I didn't even let him finish his sentence. <laughs> we became good friends and. Um, so he sorted out this place here called Forest Harmony, where people can kind of come and see it all working together. <clears throat> but to go back to your question, yeah, I guess we were working with um, what is now called Light Fire. Yeah, probably, yeah, it is around 10 years ago, because my daughter, yeah, yeah, about that. Yeah. Yeah, well, the and the, I think it was called the Soul 4, SOL 4 was yeah, what it was called yeah, in the yeah, yeah. reference. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, do you want my take on it or? Oh, uh, sure. Both that and uh, you, you still use it, or was it was it kind of a stepping stone to moving on to uh, other devices and uh, using other solar cookers for promotion? I guess um, I should rewind a little bit, and you know, I didn't realize that you know, sort of my journey or, or first interaction with solar cooking is what I kind of call the Rolls Royce um, of solar cookers, the parabolics. Um, and the the Koch design was brilliant. Uh, I went over to Germany. I've done demonstrations in Europe. I've probably shown 150 heads of state their first solar cooker. We had um, the most amazing opportunity where there was... Uh, the World Summit on Sustainable Development was in Johannesburg the year I came back, 2002. They had a follow-up a year or so later in Germany, and this was focused only on renewable energy, and it was in the old parliament, um, Bonn. And we had all these million-euro stands set up next to us, and I was positioned with a, a local politician right in front of the entrance to the hall with our little SK-10, so like a 50-euro cooker. And you could not get into the stand, into the into the event, without going through us. And it was supposed to be cloudy for the whole 10 days. We had sun every day. Um, and so people actually ignore these huge million-euro stands. As you say, the PV and stuff like that, it's not very sexy, you know? Like, there's a solar panel. That's great. Thanks. I'll charge my phone. It's different to, like, here, come and taste this strawberry jam. It's organic. I'm sorry to say it, but many of the development agencies are kind of like a washing machine or a laundromat <clears throat> in that they're bringing in product from their own countries, testing them on a tax-free basis. They hired only German people in their organization. Um, if you look at it closely, most of the money goes back to wherever it came from. And I guess there's 20 strong countries in the world. And I'm not, I don't say all of them, but, you know, being in Africa and being someone who, you know, I guess I, I stand in both worlds. So I can I can work in America or Europe. 
But when you see things from the African perspective, it's very clear that 60 years of development has just been a bit of a washing machine. It's like a bit of a, a greenwash that we can stand up in Washington or Brussels and go, we spent all this money in Africa. You drive around Africa, you're like, where? Like, like really? like So that was... That was my introduction to the development agencies. They basically used a lot of our work to continue getting their own budget. They did leave a report they spent a million rand on saying that a third of South African households would purchase a solar cooker if they were, one, available, and two, attached to a microcredit. So I then moved into carbon offset. That cooker had 150 nuts and bolts to assemble it. Yes. It, it was, I mean, I, I gave it to nuclear physicists and they sort of got things wrong. They left the plastic on. They called after like a week and they were like, we're so happy with the performance. And we're like, we got there and we're like, um, guys, uh, you're supposed to take the plate. I'm glad you're happy. It just means your expectations were really low. I mean, these are smart guys, great guys. And by then the plastic, you know, if you put it in the sun, it actually gets harder to take off. The um, the reflector. I'm sure you've made lots of people have made the mistake before. So it was a brilliant design, and it was made for being able to fit in a 20 foot container for refugee camps. You know, a lot of the solar cooker organisations have really seen the big prize as the refugee camps, which I agree. Um, <clears throat> it's always interesting. I like to know the backstory of the inventors and the people behind it, and Really, what's their motivation? <clears throat> uh, I think generally it would take about four hours to build one. Um, I got it down to about 40 minutes if I have a family of four. So if I've got two kids and a mom and dad, I could get it together on a flyby. But um, it was tricky. It didn't take much to learn to use it. And because it's an inner focus, there's no risk of fire. So that was really good. But people still complained about it being too slow. Um so I, I carried on producing them. Sunfire, in fact, produced them in South Africa when GIZ packed up. After they said it was impossible, I was like, oh, that's a job for me. I'll take on impossible. And um, we had a great contact in the local government in uh, near Durban, and he purchased 100, which we didn't have. But I had the blessing of the inventor. He said, listen, if anybody else wants to make this, I'm going to charge them a packet of money because he lost a fortune. He was actually making, um, his name was Christian Koch. So it means cook. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. He's really a good-hearted man. His name is Christian Cook. <laughs> but uh, also, you know, Africa is a different environment to work in, and people get frustrated um, with the people in the setup here. Anyway, uh, we went on literally the month they they packed up. We we started producing. We did what they <clears throat> could not do, and uh, for about four years, Sunfire Solutions produced it ourselves. I then looked and got a parabolic from China. Um, I worked with a very good company there called Lingding, and I had a fantastic um, relationship with uh, the guy that I was chatting to. And the cookers took 20 minutes to put together. They were twice as fast. And I actually was like, go China. China, you've done a better job than Germany in terms of... Um, how the solar cooker works and, and what very basic or simple people would need. I suppose it's it's not comparable, but after five years of making my clients really suffer, I was quite happy to get that cooker together. <laughs> sure. One thing I uh, noted at the conference was uh, I have a daily search on, on eBay because I collect cookers and I've, I've got about a Ooh. dozen where they just all of a sudden a real rare one popped up. And, and uh, if I had the budget for it, I just bought it. Uh, and one thing I wanted to point out by way of encouragement to people was my daily search. There's at least a dozen of those uh, parabolics from China, um, yeah, different models, different companies, probably the same stamping outfit that stamp out the six uh, exactly. uh, segments of the parabolic. But, you know, we're talking the economies of scale there that just uh, make make so much sense. Um, I had one, uh, and unfortunately, I left it out too often, didn't take care of, you know, oiling in the right places or in the paint, and it, it got pretty rusty, but I but packed it away. Like, good like yeah. that. Yeah, little maintenance, and, and it would still be out there, you know, and tarp it over or whatever, but yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I really fell in love with those. The first ones, I, I brought a 20-foot container in, 
of 1.8 meter dishes and I cried because they were just too big. I was like, oh my God, what have I done? I've still got a bunch of them here on the farm with me. I mean, that baby boils a liter of water in four minutes. I've yet to find anything in the world that you can put together in 20 minutes, put in the sun that will just light up like that. So I had I had the good fortune probably about because I had we had the resource center. Um I was phoning Solar Cookers International, Bev Blum, and I was we were like we were all over the net. Just anyone who was working with solar cookers, we were pinging them. We were like, Hey guys, what are you guys doing? This is what we're doing. Let's try and get something going. I mean, uh we didn't really know what we were doing, but we were doing it and we just wanted to see things get done. And that meant that I got flown quite early on to a conference in Nairobi called Solar Cooker Leaders from Africa and Asia. And at that conference, I had the pleasure to meet a Chinese professor. And I've always felt in our events that the Chinese are sort of out of it, and I don't understand why. But I, at this event early on, I think it was 2008, um, there was this very soft-spoken professor and he explained to me that in Gangsu province, the locals were digging roots out of the ground when they introduced the solar cookers and that they had solar cookers in their five-year programs from the 1950s onwards as a compassionate way from the Chinese government to sort out this issue that these people were facing. And from that day, from that conversation, I, I, was, I don't know if I've still got his contacts, so, but I'd love to cross paths with him again you know he explained that in just just that like i just never want to see africa or anywhere in the world get to what those people were experiencing in gongsu and i got the full breadth that china deserves its role as you know it's such a simple design but the amount of thinking that's gone into creating that simplicity is phenomenal um and he explained that they had three different tiers of manufacturers. And his favorite were the village ones. It would be a group of like 10 guys who would make them with um, uh, concrete or something like that. And then just put the silver foil on them. And he said those were his favorite. And then he got to the industrial guys, probably similar to what uh, we both bought. Um, and they're able, and I like that. I'm, I'm thinking on an industrial scale. Uh, in terms of, I'm thinking on a scale of looking at the numbers. I've always looked at the numbers. I was looking at a lot of big data in at the Wall Street in 2000. Did you know that 90% of the World Wide Web was American in 2000? There's no dot USA. So there's all this weird stuff hidden in the figures. So ever since then, I was like, okay, it's like 3 billion people need firewood, you know? And um, this is a big issue. Like, what what am I going to, how do I contribute? Um and one of the one of the real bugbears that I hit real, you know, as as a holistic thinker is that uh, aluminium being used in the SK is used mostly in outer space. Really? <laughs> yeah, that's its <laughs> biggest use. That and in office lights. Now oh, I'm sure, working. Sure. It makes sense yeah. because yes. it's the second it's the second most reflective material on Earth. So after cement, aluminium is the number one energy use on planet Earth. So should Sunfire have succeeded, we would have just made a nightmare in a different kind of way. It didn't make sense to be making one meter dishes out of them in those kinds of numbers. And I was about four years into it when it hit the wall. And I was like, oh, damn, I did not know this. Um, and with the Chinese ones, you can just buy that foil. It fits in an envelope. It would cost nothing. And that foil lasts for three years. I even locked horns with the with the menu with the, the guys because they only do the anodizing in Germany. And they were like, no, this material will last for 10 years. I'm like, no, we've had them for five years. And I was like, listen, dude, we're out here cooking. This don't work like it looks like for you in the laboratory. We're not playing favorites on anything. We're just Africans trying to make stuff work. You, so you're using you're using real sunlight. Yeah. <laughs> they probably had a lab where they had Oh my God! I never thought of that. Yeah. In the lab, they probably have five of the nine components of actual sunlight, and that's oh yeah, that lasts ten years. But <laughs> right, 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 yeah. right. I mean, yeah. So I mean, the one point eight meter dish 
we built that uh, what they now call uh, we built that Soul Four, and it did not come anywhere close, and it cost us about thirty thousand to build. But yeah, um, I mean, for me, for me, to go to Africa and Asia, uh, lead a seminar and be one of twenty people in my first two years doesn't show me what an expert I am. It shows me how few people are doing anything. Yes. And to this day, I still feel like, hell, man, if I'm the top expert in Africa, sure, that's a that's an issue, you know? I mean, that's, but, you know, I've sort of been in hibernation. I guess I hit a little bit of a wall with it all, and I needed to just change my own life. But now we're coming out great guns, and we're putting the solar caravan on the road. And, you know, there's room for all kinds of models. I'm not sure what we're going to do with a parabolic. Um, I brought three containers out. And, uh, you know, anywhere you go in South Africa, you can go to a rural Kosa tribal man. You can go to a Zulu man. You can go to an Afrikaner farmer, rich, poor, hippie, black, white, Chinese, Indian. And they go, oh, yeah, solo cooker, we've seen that somewhere. And that makes us happy. So, you know, there is a market. There is a way forward. I'm not sure exactly where we're going to go next. Um well, I think I should let you get a word in. I've got some ideas, but <laughs> well, speaking of the new, the newest uh, iteration or the cooker that uh, got, I think Dave Oxford was the first to uh, grab it and post it, and then it was on the wiki right away because the uh, Paul Hedrick and Tom Sponheim they have just been really great about making sure that archive is up to date, and it intrigues me. This has the the Fresnel lens, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And why why it intrigues me is I have, uh, of course, being the maniacal collector, I've got to have at least one of every type of cooker. And I have my own DIY one. And uh, you maybe know of the story of the Heliac, which uh, was the, it was a rolled up lens of about maybe I was in contact with them as well. Yeah, yeah we're the same. I, I collect everything as well if I can. <laughs> The, and their story the story was they had put it together and they sent out plans with the wood frame and then you put it together and two weeks later the 20 or 50 or whatever people they sent them to uh, wrote back and said well the one guy didn't pay attention in the focal point straight and hit the wooden frame and the whole thing burnt up <laughs> so they, they had to redo the plans and they basically said you'll have to do it yourself with with metal and we'll send you the lens but then that's it that that's the story as I understood it. Uh, but there well, is a guy. Still going. I'd love to, I'd love to pick that up. Cause I think one bad shift shouldn't make everyone redesign everything. You know, no yeah. one does that for candles or gas. I mean, I think people yeah. take a bit too much responsibility here. <laughs> well, what, what, what did happen? I don't know if it was before or after their foray into Fresnel lens cookers, but uh, a fellow named Bing Gu in california he has a i remember uh, him i met him yeah. at uh, sacramento yeah oh there you go well then you saw his his is the only one i think is totally safe because that fresnel lens the 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 focal cone as i call it if, is yeah. contained. Yeah, yeah yeah okay <laughs> look i mean people's idea of safety in a world where people are still building nuclear power stations yes. and we have coal and i'm like i'm always astounded People feel like they're arguing. It feels to me like people are arguing about the crumbs. You know, mm -hmm. from where we sit, we've got deforestation, we've got massive poverty. You know, if we're looking at the alternative. Our health and safety is very far from Sweden and everywhere else. Our health and safety priorities are like, let's improve what's there at the moment. And what's there at the moment is very dangerous and bad for people's health. Um, so we would do a workaround for something like that. So I'm I'm I'd love to talk to you after this and just look at who's still sure. doing what where um and start to pick up as much of that as possible. Like I'm looking at Sunfire as a conduit. Um we can put that just over the mountain from where we are on the garden route. There's almost no trees, it's semi-desert. There's sure. nothing for anything to burn next to it. So, you know, one guy burning down the frame making these people retreat that just that's kind of like yeah. blows a bit of a fuse like come on guys there's people building nuclear power stations let's just look at the what the reality check here if we're going to make a change um sure. yeah i could say a lot more but it's it's kind of like from where we sit sure. in the south of africa like no we've got way different a bunch sure. of priority issues before we get to to that yeah 
Well, and uh, to kind of cap off the Heliac story, uh, Clement Musonda, who I believe is in Zambia, you maybe have seen, I think, uh, yeah, for two years he was him. posting on. Yeah, he still has it, and he uh, turned it into a hybrid by just basically attaching an alcohol alcohol stove to the side. So if the sun goes down or clouds roll in, he can just turn on the alcohol stove, move the pot over six inches or a foot, and it's in, he's back in business. Uh, so yeah, he is he's a believer in it. Yeah. Well, there's a, there's like that's the African kind of way where you make what you can with what you have, but the you make sure you can keep cooking. Mm -hmm. you know, people got to eat. Sure. So this current current model that you uh, uh, you're working on, or have is it? Um, you say, are you making it? And you're making it in some numbers now, or what's going on with that? So what it is is there's a Scottish inventor. And uh, he came out here six years ago, and we took him around Soweto and Joburg. Probably he came down before um, we bump, bumped into the Soul 4. He came down beforehand, and, you know, he's done some... He introduces himself as the most lettered man in Scotland, but he also takes the piss of himself. He's got a wicked sense of humor. Um, and I think he teaches at a university in uh, Glasgow or Edinburgh University of Strathclyde. So they're known for engineering. And get this, his name is Sterling. It's, so, like, it's, like, history, it's like these people are born to do what they're doing or something. Christian Koch and now uh, Sterling's come along. And he's doing a Sterling job. But um, at the moment, we're in our infancy. So uh, he came he went around the world. He went to India. You know what? He told me the backstory, and I'll share it with you guys. Um, and as time goes by, I'm sure he will come onto the stage. Right now, you know everything is patented, so it's all kind of a bit under wraps. He's going big on all of it. Um, so you know, the, I, I'll, I'll say what I can say. Um, so what happened? Uh, what he told me is that. You know, him and a bunch of friends sat down at a dinner table and I guess they've been friends for a while and they said, oh, how do we really make a difference in the world? And they hit, across the, hit upon the clean cooking. And, um, you know, they, they gave him, a, each one put in some money and they gave him the pot. And so it's kind of self-funded and that's why I'm personally more of a copy left than a copyright person. And most of the solar cooker world is very open source and sharing. Um, but, uh, you know, I understand that he's trying to build a business. And my own decision was to run Sunfire as a business so that I wouldn't be asking anyone for money. Um, so that we'd be able to fund our own whatever, the, whatever we want to do. Uh, so they put the pots of money together. He came out here. Um he went to India and a bunch of other places. Nothing really stuck. But what he's done, and we've got the first iteration of it, so there are only 10 being produced here in South Africa. It's being produced by a company called DeFi, which is probably South Africa's biggest appliance manufacturer. Um, wow. Yeah, they're big. So they make all the fridges. They make all the stoves. Because he's going for scale. He's thinking on that industrial level there as well. And it actually nicely dovetails with suddenly I'm phoning schools. So my job since July last year has been to find feeding schemes in schools. There were to be 20. But now we've been whittled down to about 10. Um, and it's been, we were going to launch um, last year sometime, but uh, it's it's a large project. Um he approached me and said, would I like to write a proposal with him for the UK government, uh, the Innovate UK? And I said, listen, Sterling, I don't do business plans. I don't write business proposals. I don't, you know, no. Funding, mm, I've been down that road. You spend a month giving someone your best ideas and they write back, no. No, thank you. Uh, I'd rather be working in a township, scratching in the dust and dealing with that kind of stuff again. It's where what I got to. I got some stories around that. Um, but it, because it was him and I knew, you know, he's got the clout and he's got the, the pedigree to pull it through. I said, sure, Sterling, we'll come in. 
So, you know, Sunfire flies the banner for solar cooking through a lot of Africa because we've worked West Africa, East Africa, everywhere. Um, and even though I haven't really been that good at putting together our social media, but we've been featured on the BBC and Al Jazeera. And as from a marketing perspective, I find it very easy to get the news to come and take a picture of a shiny thing. I mean, who doesn't want to do that? Getting press to, to, to come and cover solar cooking is very easy. It's the same way I got most of us. Shiny stuff. Woo! <laughs> but, um, you know, he came back and, uh, you know, first, uh, then we got University of Stellenbosch involved and they're making a biochar drum. And then he got DeFi involved and DeFi are owned by a Turkish company called Archelic, who are the fifth biggest suppliers of appliances in Europe. And with the carbon offset tax has been put in place in Europe, um, it now means it's uh, almost like a penalty system for companies. Like it's a, if you're not offsetting your carbon, it's at $50 a ton or something like that, or it's going to it's gonna go up. And I, I worked in carbon offsetting from 2004 to 2008 and wrote and designed my own progr programs as a means to get to how to fund solar cookers for people. You know, I got really tired of it happened in Lesotho for the first time where I had to put a solar cooker back in a car and look in the rear view mirror of my UN vehicle at people who wanted a technology that I couldn't get to them with a coin just because they didn't have a coin in their pocket. And, and it broke my heart and it broke their heart. And I'd like to get back there because Lesotho is like Nepal. It's above the tree line. So these guys, you can take all those high level market research and throw it out the window. Let's just make the stuff available to them. Please, can we just find a way to put it in their hands? Um, Ocelic has got a new CEO, and he's very forward-thinking, and he sees a way for DeFi and uh, the group of companies that own another big one in India to offset their own carbon internally through this large solar cooker. So we're quite excited about it. Um, the unit that it's, it's now sort of been mangled and put through a machine of the inventor trying to get it mass manufactured and the mass manufacturer being like, you want us to do what? You want us to make what? Um, so we've got like a 0 0.1, which we all know is it's great, but it's not the full version. This was all a prelude. So the full version that arrived with in Joburg has a Roman clock. has a, literally a Roman clock that turns the unit with the sun and cleans the water at the same time. So it's got an automatic tracking, but it's it's 2,000-year-old tech because it's a damn good idea to avoid electronics in Africa, Asia, and uh, you know India and China. I mean, basically anywhere where there's not a convenience store. In fact, anywhere. Like, let's just all low-tech makes sense. Um, and so it's cleaning the water. I forget how much. And it can generate electricity. It has tags. Electricity enough to charge like laptops, run a few lights. So it's a little miniature electrical generator and it has a fire bed backup using biochar. And the Fresnel lens on the top, so it goes onto a heat sink with heat pipes and um, comes up into a big oven chamber that cooks a 30 liter pot. And if it was run at full force, 24 hours in a day, it can cook 1,500 meals um, based on the UN 33 grams per portion. And uh, it's landed in, it's a dream come true. It's after 20 years. Um, we actually have the opportunity to do what we set out to do 20 years ago. And on the basis of that, we're also launching the solar caravan. So we launched the first one this week. We put it out 30 kilometers away from us. And we're going to do another one here in our closest town in Neisner. And I'm happy to kind of post our progress. I'd love to. Um, the idea is to keep it as a live campaign that people can come in and support. And we'd like to be putting out, you know, what are our household cookers? Sunfire and most of us are doing household cookers. You know, we can cook for 10 people, 12 people, but mostly SK10, or we call it the Sunfire 10, one meter. That's a four four liter pot, five liter pot. So that's a family of five or six. You know, an oven. I'd like to see every home have both. 
because you got an oven underneath and then your parabolic is a fryer or some sort of a quick cooker. But we're getting an opportunity to put these first seven out. Um, two feeding schemes. We're doing some schools. We're doing a small town called Barrydale, which only has 5,000 people. And we've got a great support team there. Or we've got people doing great work in that town. They're setting up gardens to feed people. You know, since the 2019 flu, there's been a lot of really hungry people. And, um, you know, we're always, Africa's going to always be at the margin of society. You know, India's, I was in India in October, and the amount of wealth that's accrued there compared to how Africa's fared in the last 20 years. Not going to go into reasons why. Let's just look at what people are at. And people are still poor. I mean, there are poor, you know, poor people in America, poor people in England, but but there are a lot of really vulnerable folk here. So, you know, there's a lot of South African folk that have stepped up and they're they're still doing soup kitchens and they're now trying to grow the food. And now we have an opportunity to introduce a large cooker that can cook for hundreds of people a day, if need be. And so that project's live now. We're, we're launching at this moment. Sure. That's, that's fantastic. Just the last five minutes, there are probably 15 bullet points. I wish I could remember in my head because I wanted to ask <laughs> questions. No, but... <laughs> I'm sorry. We might have to do another one, but um, I'm sorry. Yeah. It's a lot. I haven't spoken to anyone about all of this, and my colleague John's just walked into the kitchen. So last week we just decided, you know what? We can't keep it under wraps. Sterling is now waiting for DeFi to sign on the dotted line. So in the next three months, we'll get some good data. Um, I'm going to put on my carbon offset hat. My company was called African Carbon Solutions and help them navigate some of that. I'm happy to do it in the voluntary space. But um, yeah, uh, if we get the good data back and we can show what fuel savings there are, you know, we and, and DeFi sign on the dotted line, these first 10 units will make the way for the next 2,000 to be made. And we'll now actually be able to start. So in my mind, it's it's, it's a, I've always had this picture that we could roll through Africa. And as the caravan rolls through, we're leaving this technology, this low-tech technology. As climate change kicks in, as the horrible effects of deforestation keep on increasing, you know, Africa's got bigger population sizes. The trees are further and further away. The grandmothers are going, no, you're lazy. They don't realize, no, lady, those trees are like an extra 10 Ks away. So the need has never been greater. And if we can get a big company like DeFi to sign on the dotted line, they would then have the IP for South Africa. We've got a real way forward to introduce solar cooking. You know, it could be for game lodges. He's particularly looking at, you know, refugee camps. So all on the equator, Uganda, Kenya, Pakistan, you know, things are about to get interesting. Later in the Clean Cook Stove Alliance, uh, getting Indian government subsidies to subsidize LPG as clean cooking fuel. While a perfectly good technology is not getting rolled out again, it's like this industry, these fossil fools keep forcing us to take half steps. We want to take a full step now. This generation needs to take a full step forward. Um so maybe I can, that kind of segues into the solar caravan and what we're trying to do there. I don't know if you've got bandwidth for that. I don't know how we're doing time-wise. Oh, I'm fine. Yeah, I, I, I retired from my day job uh, last May. And so this is it. This is my life. <laughs> oh, fantastic. It's the same for us. <laughs> yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, well, so if, before before we get back to the caravan, I, I want to be, while well, it's still fresh in my brain, the, the two things that you mentioned, DeFi, um, in the states, the it's like the holy grail for uh, solar cooker makers here to get onto REI's catalog, the camping, big, huge camping, back to nature and all that, and and then you go into their store and like, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> but to be able to do that, that's one thing they say is uh, we we make it, we get to the point where the solar cooker is a considered a legitimate appliance. To the point where a company will do that. So what you, what you're talking about there is earth shaking, I think. Um, yeah. And it would be it'd be great news to be able to share with people to say that could happen. And we actually got into one of the big camping stores in South Africa, and 
They didn't sell any of the product. I imported an entire container on the basis of thinking like, oh my God, this is it. And it completely was a dud. But I think if we did it now with South Africa not having any power, we probably do really well. Like we literally have power cuts every day. Now we've got people beating down our door for solar cooking. So the culture of the camping, camping is huge here. And I'd say with Sunfire, what's kept us going it's probably about a third of forward, a third of buyers have been like professionals, architects, lawyers, just forward thinking people who are like, man, I really love that. Um, yeah, I'm down. Give me one. And they normally would have had to have met us at a show. Um, we had a, yeah, our online presence is growing. We've actually sold quite a few you know, recently again, but we've mostly been focused on other solar tech to support our love of solar cookers. So at least a third was um, is professional forward thinking people, and another third would probably be gardeners and like uh, I'd say Zimbabweans because their country imploded in around two thousand. So we got most of Zimbabwe just came into South Africa, and they would just buy them and send them straight home. And then probably a third uh, have been like organisations phoning us up and going, "Hey, you mind going to Uganda and?" Uh, showing people how this oven works at that, that, that large uh, soul, soul oven, the solar oven, um, Paul Munson's cooker. Oh, sure. I got sent yeah, up the, 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 the sun oven. Yes. I, got, I got sent up to Uganda to do training on that. I'd never seen one before. But When was this? When was this? God, that must be 2012, 2013. Okay. Because I just interviewed the third owner. Paul Munson was in the middle after Tom Burns created it, and <clears> Paul Munson, and now it's uh, uh, Trip Crits. And I was at their uh, space in North Carolina where they are designing the uh, factory floor plans. So they can do it all lean. You know, everything is all in the right order. The tools are right in the right places and so forth. And, okay, but cool. So I have that and use it uh, for wow. a few, use it for some demonstrations. It's really amazing. I've got, well, I've got the small one here. So I've got the small yeah. one that was given to me at a conference in Spain by Paul Munson to look at introducing oh, wow. it into South Africa. And I've got uh, the one from the Sun Cook in Portugal, sure. um, which I did end up importing. And I'm looking to make an oven locally at the moment because we don't have an oven in South Africa and it could really take off at the moment. But I've been quite busy with this large scale cooker. Um, so I haven't actually gotten to that. But yeah, my intention is to make a solar oven this year in South Africa. I'm talking to cool. people now. I had an industrial designer come out also about 12, 13 years ago and design a, a really cute, uh, lightweight solar oven, which I'm now, I've been looking to find a manufacturer locally, but it's, everyone here is quite busy. This is a, a woodworking town, so they, they make a lot of yachts here, a lot of furniture. So I come along with my solar oven designs, and they're like, yeah, well, maybe. I was like, yeah, we just want five to start with. and But I think I might have find some, found some people just now in the last week or two. So so back to the caravan. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, so what's what's the current status? Do you have like a, an itinerary of a, a, a route, or is it just kind of catch as catch can, or how is that going to work? We're, putting, we're actually busy working on that now. So we'll have all of the cookers rolled out in the next five weeks. So by the end of April, every cooker will be in place. And we'll have the routes on our website. And we're also going to be running a fierce campaign on YouTube. So nice. that's where David would have picked it up from. Um, I'd love to get over to his green gathering in there as well. Um, so you, with the solar caravan, we're going to be, it's, we're going to be, it's essentially a storytelling, it's a storytelling campaign. We're going to be using film uh, a lot. So we'll be posting on YouTube as we go and we'll have our route on our website. There's a, a place on the back of the website where you can sign up Um let me try to encapsulate it. Just we've been all over the world now. I'm just trying to form my thoughts. So out of working with all the different projects, the UN projects, the 
large number of organization, government projects, sort of identified decision making as one of the key weaknesses in getting solar cookers out and being able to get any kind of a situation on the ground into reality. There's all this great tech and it never seems to get through to the to where we wanted to get to. So we've always done the rocket stove. We've always done the retained heat bag. We've always done those as a complete kit. We know that that can save 80% of firewood. I'm happy to do carbon offsetting again, but I prefer a direct person to person. Um, brother man, I prefer a direct person to person um, relationship where people are able to fund directly to a community. So the solar caravan is the bridge to that. We're going to go into communities. We're going to film what's going on there at this moment in real time. And we're going to go and identify a bunch of problems. What we're going to do is go and find problems. And we're hoping through YouTube and through storytelling that we can generate enough interest and support. Our target is to get up to a million people, a million um a million folk to actually follow what we're doing as a solar caravan. And it's going to be not just solar cooking, it's going to be seed saving, it's going to be recycling, it's going to be the whole smorgasbord of sustainability. Um, because that's what any that's what any community or small town needs. So we're, we're going to create a direct funding mechanism. I think we'll, you know, we're going to take a percentage from anything that will all be open for any of the work that we're doing, but we want everything to go directly to the community. Sure. Um, yeah, there's more I could say. That that's it in a nutshell. So we, we'd like to have, we'd like to have like a committee that could deal with issues in the different communities that we come across. So if we know ten people or you know ten people, and like you know what, we're really touched by this one community. It's really poor there. How can we help solve malnutrition? We'll provide a platform for that, and then uh, create lots of little, lots of little committees and lots of little pods to deal with the community identified issues. And right now, we're seeing hunger is a big one. Uh, I was uh, starting to say that I'm looking up a guy from India who was featured in National Geographic magazine, Chetan Solanki, and he I has an know. online, yeah, online um, uh, web class he calls it the solar university and he says at the Ooh. end you get what he calls a license in energy literacy uh wow. and it's just you know, it's a token thing but it's basically talking about well here's here's how many trees are going away here's how much coal is is wrecking the environment and so forth a very worthwhile but he ha i interviewed him and he said i have a, i'm on an 11 year swaraj where he's going through uh india and he wants to get a million Indians to be solar cooking by the time he's done. Uh, he has a bus that's outfitted with solar direct uh, DC current to induction mm -hmm. and microwaves and stuff. But uh, that's it's in. And I, I sense, you know, you're uh, you guys are birds of a feather. You know, where uh, being able to just get out there and get the message is is so critical. So the, the concept with the solar caravan is. We're going to do what we can here in uh, South Africa. But yeah. ultimately, there should be a caravan in every province. There are nine in yeah. South Africa. And then, you know, what you're doing in the States with your road trip, that's a caravan. So the caravan should be in every country. There should be in every state. They should be going everywhere. And uh, it's a, a caravan from the silk caravan of old. You know, when yes. we were when silk was coming from Beijing to London, it was knowledge that was being spread. So I have a feeling... The tech that we're carrying is, it's a great, it's a nice to have. We want to really put tools on the ground that people can can use to improve their lives. But it's the connectivity between people in Africa and between people all over the world. That's where I think the magic is really going to happen. It's actually knowledge sharing. It's not really funds or technology. It's It's like, as we have the World Wide Web now, and I can be sitting here in South Africa and you can be sitting there in the States. We're just bringing that out of the laptops and bringing it into the 5D, I guess. You know, what you're doing, taking the message out. This guy in India, I mean, that's just next level. DC bus, I'm like just 
Oh, wow. Yeah. People, yeah. people often ask me, do you have a caravan? I'm like, no, no, it's like, you know, lots of camels in a line, you know. We're, so, the, so we're launching sort of phase one of the caravan now, and we're using this large cooker um, as the mascot. But we'll still be doing the parabolics. We'll still be doing the ovens. And that's why we'd love to talk to other inventors, other um, makers around the world. And, you know, we'll be in a position to set up little groups in each community that they can try to make this. You know, if we don't if we don't need to make money out of it, that would suit us much better. Like, you know, I see the limit with Sunfire as to how far we can go. And we can't reach 70 or 80 percent of the country. So while it's great to be sort of commercially successful, not that we are, but we're able to hold our own, the real work in our part of the world is how to reach the people without coin in their pocket. How do we do that? And I just think, you know, we live in a society at the moment where, um, yeah, we've all been hit quite hard by the uh, by the, the COVID um, story financially. The world's gotten... You know, the way that was managed just flattened a lot of us. But, but um, you know, with blockchain and crypto, um, adding in the carbon, if, if we throw in a mixture of that, so where people can buy, buy. If people need to pay a 10 or 15% token, but we've got the rest covered by sponsors, then we want to see that happen. So we'll use these first seven project sites um as a litmus test because we'll be going back to those places again and again and what i'm getting to is there's a phase two where in about a year or so where things have stabilized we'll be actually able to say to people all over the world the inter international community like come in if you want to build a school in that village here is a safe place for you to go and do that you know you just go there and this is the lady you speak to she'll be waiting for you we're going to, it's just, it's going to be, it's going to be beautiful and that people can get involved without middlemen. We kind of wanting to take away the middlemen as much as possible. The, the UN uses 90% of its income to come in to, I mean, for its own purposes, 90% of their money goes to serving their own people. And I've got an aunt in Australia and um, she was up North and she was saying, yeah, the guys fly in from Jakarta and whatever their clothing budget is bigger than the people that they're supposed to be serving. So we're seeing the same across the board in development. We're seeing that the corporations, unless there's a, a way for them to make a whole whack of money, their intention, uh, they're, they're unable, they're not suited. The carbon offsetting, we can use it, but on our own terms, because I know for a fact that the carbon offsetting uh, system was set up for solar cooking. I had a deep moment in Durban in COP19 with one of the very top people of the UNFCC because um, I was there demonstrating for 10 days with the solar cookers again. And we almost like it was in an evening time and then we was quiet. It was almost crying like we've set up this entire mechanism. Why aren't we seeing this kind of tech come through? And I was like, you know, I get it. I'm working so hard to cut through all the middlemen just so that we can get this technology to where it needs to get to. And with the carbon offsetting, I feel like it can be used very crookedly, but it can also be used for honesty and integrity. It is a new piece on the board. But honestly, if I could short circuit all of that and just go, you want to help someone? Here's a way for you to help someone. Here's the footage in real time. Let's just do it. We've got the system set up that we can drop ship from anywhere in South Africa. So we'll focus on South Africa to begin with. Pretty much South and Southern Africa are all combined anyway, like Namibia, Botswana, Swaziland, Lesotho, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, Zambia. We're kind of one block. We have one weather channel. We have a, most of those people are, have their own ways of getting things across the border. So if we can make it work in South Africa, we can really do a lot of good for Southern Africa. And that will be person to person. And along the way, we'll unlock all of the potential that's sitting latent all over the world, you know. We have so much talent and so many ideas, and it just feels like a, a really good time for it. And this fits so many different topics of the I mentioned in my original note about the online class. 
uh, that uh, Stefan Karnebeck with uh, Engineers Without Borders proposed. It's coming on about a, a year and a half ago now, I think. And uh, um, I'm starting to collect content. And basically, it's just being able to say, well, here's one model, the business model thing that we could probably, that could probably be the first topic. So so with the Solar Caravan, we're going to have on our website a drop-down menu. And you would be able to sponsor a business in a box, which would be, we also do the small-scale solar lighting kits that charge phones. So you can buy a small business or sponsor a small business for someone in that community to go out and start their own business. Why not set up little solar oven workshops in each place you know, with a bit of mentorship so that there's a space for free stuff, I guess? Um, it's not necessarily free, but like we should be able to, I'm all for the gifting economy. If, if we can make something happen that's not costing too much skin off of our backs using the global tech that we have, you know, if there's a collective of real good solar cooker enthusiasts, then if they're happy to mentor, particularly this project in Barrydale, it would be a great thing to set that up. Then let someone in the community make it. Let him sell it to his local people. Sunfire has a great online platform, uh, mostly thanks to John. So we can actually from whatever workshop anywhere in South Africa, sell on behalf of that local business. We're not precious about that. We'll support the local business. There's more than enough room to go around. Um, so let's do business where we can do business. You know, we're working with the Anglican Church here in Plett. We're working with another church in Neisner. We're working with a school group um, in a place called New Bethesda, which I'll tell you all about. It's a very... Um, it's a very sort of magical place that uh, occupies almost an ethereal space in the realm of South Africans because of a lady who built lots of owls there 60 years ago. Um, it's called the Owl House. And then we go working with a lady who's got a soup kitchen in Grafrenet. And it's, you know, part of what we're going to do is also show people just how cool South Africa really is and how many amazing people are doing really good work with almost nothing. You know, um, so the idea is to lift everyone together, but we can only do that if we work together as a collective. So I love everything you're saying. It's just hitting all the notes. Well, I can't think of any other questions, and uh, I don't know what your what your day is like. I mean, mine. Uh, I'm I've got a backlog of about eight visits I got to edit before I leave on my trip in May. And okay, well, uh, we'll Thanks. let you get back. Thanks so much. This is fantastic, and uh, we'll definitely yeah, I really be. Enjoyed this. Yeah, probably uh, July. It will be after my trip is over toward the end of June, and so July will. I'll put a little tickler in my calendar to touch base. Yeah, dude. Let's let's talk again then. That'd be great. Yes. Okay. Very good. Take care. You too. Have fun. Yep. Thanks. Keep spreading, keep, keep spreading the gospel. We'll do. <laughs> <laughs>